Uh, thank you, Hugh. Um, uh, as you mentioned, Megalithic Odyssey, my forthcoming TV series and book. Um, you can catch that at megalithicodyssey.com. There's a free online promo coming up in May. All you've got to do is go to the website and register, uh, and you can check out all about it there. Um, I'm going to try and morph these two things together today for uh, the purpose of the presentation. Uh, but this was my first book, and uh, this one kind of came into being itself, um, as you'll see in a moment. But um, uh, who's here that wasn't here yesterday? Has anybody just arrived today? Okay, just the one. Oh, wow. Uh, okay, so I won't go into my background too much as I did yesterday, uh, but I am a systems analyst. Um, and again, it's pertinent to what my approach to the megaliths are. Uh, my job as an engineer was to go into extremely high engineering industrial operations. I worked in the most automated plant in Britain at one point, was my last job. Uh, which was five square kilometers, and when the plant broke down, it was my job to go in with a laptop and fix it. And uh, what's so pertinent about that is I, I take all the data, electro, mechanical, electronic systems, um, computer-aided engineering, and I would put all those pieces of data together and look for the complexity of everything and look at all the data and try and fix the problem. And I don't see the megaliths. Uh, of Western Europe any different. I see that the whole system of knowledge is a very fragmented story. We're left with fragments of the past. There's astronomy, acoustics. It's all sitting there, and it's an incredibly complex problem to figure out who these people were. Um, and I got subjected to that, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. Um, this is actually Newgrange, where I grew up, uh, about 10 miles from Newgrange. That's where I was born. I don't live there now. but uh, And that was the first place I... Uh, I became aware of megaliths, and uh, if you only ever see Newgrange and the Boyne Valley megaliths, it's quite a major piece of the puzzle anyway. Uh, some 40 passage tombs in the Boyne Valley. Um, most complex megalithic site in the world. 250 tons, 1,000 tons of material just to build Newgrange alone. Um, and it's waterproof for 5,200 years. That's how they've carbon dated. They actually corbel vaulted the ceiling. Uh, and when they corbel vaulted the ceiling, they put little gullies into the tops of the stones, and it's organic matter that was in the tops of the stones in those gullies uh, that kept it watertight, but also were able to carbon date, uh, and that's where they get the date of 3200 BC. There's about a 200-year window, and that's important. Uh, so 3200 BC to 3000 BC for Newgrange. Uh, but this was the first place I, uh, I got to go visit. Um, I then I had gone off to England and Scotland to work for probably about 14 years uh, as an engineer and systems analyst on that. Uh, in my absence, uh, I just, I'd done two degrees, two masters, um, and I wanted a break, and I came home uh, after my 14-year reign of terror in the British Isles, doing all my engineering and exploring my, uh, my vocation. But uh, uh, this is uh, just an overview. This is dose. I'm going to talk about this in a moment. Uh, so there's Newgrange there, this is the Google Earth uh, satellite. There's no, there's 18 satellite passage tombs around the main one. Uh, so you can see the complexity of the landscape. There's more passage tombs here. This is the River Boyne. Um, and then 10 miles from there is Tara Hill. So the whole complex itself is quite a big, expansive operation. Um, I'm going to talk about those there. See those there? It's actually the second largest henge. It's not even on the map there. It's just to the right as well. Um, so I found myself uh, giving somebody a tour uh, of Doth, and this is uh, what's called the Pleiades stone, uh, Kerbstone K51. I've drawn you an artist sketch of what it looks like because it's very hard to see the photograph, but uh, it's quite ornate, uh, and it's quite a very important piece of rock art. Uh, but I was asked a question about it, and a very technical engineering question, and I didn't know the answer. When James doesn't know the answer, James goes and looks it up. Uh, and that's the engineering. I, mean, I want to know the solution, and, and I see a problem. And I found the work of Martin Brennan. If anybody knows Martin Brennan's work? Uh, yeah, he's an, he was an artist. And I, I, I just find it amazing that some of the greatest insights are not engineers or, 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 or physicists or astronomers. It's actually artists or musicians that come to these monuments, uh, and they make interesting insights. So he provided a massive body of work. And when I got into Martin Brennan's work, uh, I realized there was so much art in Ireland, and I'm going to talk about it in a moment. And uh, I just, I realized something, there was a lot of passage tombs and there was lots of art, and it was a big piece of the story in Ireland. I didn't research the Irish monuments because I lived there. I researched the, 
Irish monuments because there's a major part of the puzzle there. Uh, this is uh, me at Ardmore Equinox Stone. I'm going to show you a little video in just a moment. Uh, myself and you were there last week for Megalithic Odyssey filming. Uh, and this is probably the most important rock art in the island of Ireland, if not Europe for that matter. Uh, situated in Donegal, showing you two constellations, Ursa Major, Ursa Minor. Um, and this should play the video if I'm just there. Uh, I'm standing here at what I have called the Ardmore Equinox Stone. And you'll see it's quite impressive rock art on this. Uh, pay attention to the almost hairline fracture running through the, the notch on the top of the stone there. That's not accidental. Um, but you have two constellations. Well, you have the constellation of Ursa Major, one, two, three stars, and Ursa Minor, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. They're sister constellations. This would be uh, Polaris of the Ursa Minor constellation, and they're both drawn in two halves of the stone. The notch at the top actually is a, no accident. It actually puts a, a natural hairline running down through the center of the stone. And this stone is at a no accidental angle as well. It's actually offset to Loch Foyle at, our, at, our, at the back of us here. And you would think that they would face the art to the, the nicest real estate in the country, but they don't do that. They actually face its own image in the sky. So this standing stone with its art of Ursa Major and Ursa Minor on the right and on the left faces its own image in the sky. And what it does is something very different than 3200 BC, 3000 BC. It does a dance in the sky and it flips around the pole because Polaris is the pole star today, but it wasn't back then. And what happens is you get Ursa Major, Ursa Minor doing a dance in the sky revolving around the North Pole and it does it every equinox, March 21st and September 21st, taking those two dates as the equinoxes. It's an incredibly beautiful, uh, exquisite piece of art um, here in the county of Donegal. This is incredibly important too, this star here, because it is actually the brightest star of Ursa Major 2, and we see three concentric rings around it, uh, most likely delineating uh, it as the brightest star of the constellation. There is actually other art on the stone down there uh, that you can hardly see. It's buried in the ground with the, the growth, but um, there may have been other stuff on the stone at some point. This may have been a, some sort of a moon calculation uh, some people discuss, but, but uh, yeah, the Ardmore Equinox Stone. Um, I found it amazing that in 2007 I discovered this, well I didn't discover, I discovered a stone and I, I didn't find it in the record. I found nothing about Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, I found nothing about the equinox uh, alignment of the poles flipping, uh, this constellation flipping around the pole. Um, I found one obscure reference to the stone which was erroneous and making out, actually the art was distorted to make it work but apart from that it's little known about stone. And, uh, I opened up a lot of questions for me. Um, I, I wanted to know, first of all, why it wasn't in the record. Um, and you've got to think, some of these things are really remote. The island of Ireland is only one twelfth the population of Britain. Um, this is in a remote part of Ireland up the northwest, in the middle of nowhere. There's no signpost to it. Only hardened megalithic researchers that wants to go and look for this stuff. I mean, the, the local people don't even know where this is at in the field. There's no signpost, there's no way to get there, and you'll have to find a GPS coordinate for it and go look for it. And when you get there, you might recognize it for what it is. So I just found it amazing in 2007 that that's what I found. And I, uh, I just, um, like I say, I just came across Martin Brennan's work. And I just came across Martin Brennan's work. And uh, I was on a crusade researching rock art. Uh, and when I come across this, I realized something very important. Let me just skip now. Uh, which led me to write this book, The New Grain Serious Mystery. I realized that. Um, Newgrange, uh, probably the most famous Pasha's tomb, uh, to equal to Maze Howe or Gabriny. Um, but um, we have something like 127 Pasha's tombs in Ireland, but the majority of them have rock art on them. And I'm aware of that. And I'm, I think most people don't realize that. 75% of the rock art uh, of Europe is on the island of Ireland, and 45% of that rock art is in one location in the Boyne Valley within a two mile radius. And if you're going to go and figure out any part of the story, 
you've got to go to where the data is, and the data is screaming at you with all the art. It's got entoptic phenomena, like I explained on the acoustics yesterday, but it's lots of astronomical art. And if you're going to understand what an astronomical culture did, you're going to have to look at their astronomy. And if you don't have any art to look at, you're not going to interpret anything. It's going to be very conceptual, and it's going to be very difficult. Um, the fact that you have passageways, uh, you have alignments as well. Uh, so it's incredibly important. So I ended up going on a research crusade around the British Isles and Europe for that matter, but mostly concentrating on Ireland. And I realised something very important was that Newgrange was a processional calculator, and there's a whole conceptual reason why that is. Um, but Newgrange is aligned to the star series as a crew processional calculator. I'm going to explain this to you in a bit. Uh, it seems it was the pinnacle of a theme of passage grave cosmology. I coined that term, passage grave, I don't even like the name. Passage graves, uh, you could equally call them chambered mounds, or it's probably a more respectful name. I think they just concentrate on the, on the passage tomb function. Um, but the passage grave cosmology running throughout Ireland is uh, incredibly unique, because uh, there's a lot of the story to figure out. Uh, the knowledge of procession of the equinoxes is inherent in the passage graves of Ireland, a fact that has never been explained or addressed until now. Um, there we have Newgrange Passage Tomb. Uh, ignore that uh, quartz facade there. That's just butchery from the 1960s. I, I'm quite outspoken about that. I think it's hideous looking. Uh, it looks nice and pristine, but it's a 1960s uh, facade. Inside, it's pristine. It's an absolute beautiful masterpiece work of art. Uh, let's zoom in a little closer. Uh, you can see the curb stones there. This is the famous curb stone I'll show you in a moment. There's a light box there. Is any, everybody's familiar with Newgrange? Yes? I'll present that. Zoom in a little closer. Uh, and there you have the famous Triskelly or tri-spiral, as I call it. Uh, there's an equinox line there. Sorry, a solstice line uh, right there. And from the center of that tri-spiral to that line is an important measurement, which I'm going to show you in a moment. A little closer on that. There's 26 interpretations for what that tri-spiral is at present. And my one is the only one that explains why there's a tri-spiral inside as well. This is in the back chamber, and most people don't even show you this on the tour anymore. There's so many people come in and out of Newgrange nowadays that uh, they really, um, they just don't even have time to show you this anymore, but it's in the back recess. Um, and it's exactly one third the size replica of what's on the entrance stone. Um, and that was a question that when I looked at all this art, I wanted to figure out. I said, well, why is it inside and outside? I said, there must be some relationship. They draw you a smaller model of it. Um, there's obviously a good reason for that. So we have a need to define the megalithic culture. Well, I do anyway. That's my systems analyst brain kicking in. How do you do that? And you get to a point where you're realizing things about megaliths. I'm sure you guys are all here today because there's something mysterious about megaliths. That's just what it attracts you. And uh, you, everybody, when they come across a mystery or a situation, they're going to process it in their own way. How do we do that? What parameters do we use? What's the legacy of knowledge? Where, who were the people who built the megaliths? These are just imposing questions that come at you as a result of you know, being intrigued into a subject. And this is the bodies of knowledge that I've been tackling, especially in Megalithic Odyssey, the documentary. Uh, the astronomers, because that's what they were, they were astronomers, they had alignments in cosmology. They were acousticians, like I spoke about yesterday. Uh, lots of evidence for altered states of consciousness. They were shamans with their practices and their rituals. Um, they were engineers, they built the monuments, um, sometimes extreme engineering practices. Uh, and they were artists as well. Um, there were artifacts and their art indicate their way of life. Um, personally, I think they were artists first and engineers second. I think they were very much a right brain culture. Uh, and they're not mutually the opposite of each other, left brain and right brain. This is really important when you look at the distribution maps of, uh, this is Western European megalithic regions. Uh, these are all the megalithic hotspots. You can see the hugs the Western European coastline, all the way around. Uh, it's not accurate, this map. It doesn't take in uh, Corsica and Sardinia and Malta there, but for the most part, uh, it's instrumental in showing you something. Ireland is pretty much just riddled with it. Everywhere you look, the density of pop uh, on that island is just totally riddled. And then you can see that it fades away on the eastern side of England for some reason, but you can tell just by looking at that map that they were a maritime culture. And I'm going to explain a bit about that later on. Megalithic arch architecture, age and distribution. Let's look at the regions where the megaliths occur versus the antiquity of megalithic Europe. 
Uh, the orange spots are the oldest. And you can see that's Carol Keel and Carol Moore. Uh, tips of all the islands, tips of the top of Brittany. They're all in little pockets. That map doesn't make sense. If you look at that map, it doesn't make sense unless you apply a maritime culture. And that's important. Because if it was deep antiquity and they started in one location, they would spread. Think of the Romans. The Romans start in Rome and they spread like a virus across Europe. You know, we don't see that in megalithic Europe. We see hot spots and pockets of deep antiquity scattered to and from each other. And then we see them moving inland. So they landed on coastlines. That, by the way, is uh, Sligo Bay, one of the natural landing bays of Ireland. And that's the Gulf of Moor behind. It's a natural landing bay as well. Two, two of the best landing bays if you were to come from the West Atlantic. And that's, imp that's important. I'll explain that later. Uh, but yeah, think of them landing at those tipping points of Europe and then spreading inland. And that's what you see. It's a density distribution map. Uh, two time frames, 4800 BC and then 3000 BC to 1200. Uh, Terrajan Temple has boat art, by the way, so this isn't just a, a concept. There's lots of evidence to suggest uh, a maritime culture aspect. Uh, the Orkneys, the Neolithic spheres that are found up there, they have a fish paste varnish. These were fishermen and mariners as well. Uh, and the Orkneys, Neolithic spheres, there's actually some of them found in Northern Ireland as well. Um, the Irish mythology also tells us all about this. They say that they were children of the sea and that. Uh, the Isle of Man, somebody's from the Isle of Man today here, the Manan and MacLear, uh, same as the Irish mythology, uh, it's deeply ritually uh, associated with the sea as well. And you cannot transmit all of that megalithic knowledge to all of those locations all across Europe without crossing the sea. I'm, I'm stressing this point like it's, it, it's, 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 not a, it's not a hard concept to grasp when I show it to you that. But you have to understand it's not accepted in archaeology that these guys were mariners. Um, mariners need astronomy as well when they travel. That's an important point as well. What are the megaliths? Um, any of those countries are megaliths, really. Um, I find them all equally interesting. Uh, I won't go through them all. But uh, predominantly, I'm talking today with the Northwestern European megaliths. They were their own culture. They were their own entity. They had the traditional use of the term megalithic uh, before we attribute it to anything with a big stone now. But, uh, classified by the unique culture who built them, Neolithic era or the Beaker people. Uh, these namesakes, by the way, Neolithic and Megalithic and all these labels that we get from archaeology, it's incredibly confusing for people. People ask me, what are Megaliths? Uh, who aren't familiar with my work or I meet in the real world from non-Megalithic people and I don't know how to explain it to them. I go, I have to explain, like, oh, you know what Stonehenge is? And then you go, oh, yes, and you have to give them some sort of a familiar site so that they, but how do you explain what megaliths are to people who don't understand? It's, it's incre you have to kind of profile who they are and what they did and kind of give them a whole body of knowledge in two sentences. It's incredibly difficult. But uh, all throughout the Mediterranean base and the Northwest European coastline, none of those megalithic territories that I just explained to you, none of those regions talk to each other. The Sardinians don't talk to the Corsicans, they don't talk to the Portuguese, they don't talk to the Spanish, they don't talk to the Irish, they don't talk to the English. There's no networking database there. It's incredibly frustrating as a researcher. Uh, even within Ireland, people you know, don't, in Sligo don't talk to the people at Newgrange. They're just their own monuments and it's just kind of manipulated and controlled for the purpose of uh, uh, financing them out to uh, tourists. Um, the common design of the structures, they're unique styles, but they're widespread across Europe. This is, the, this is the epiphany for me here. I mean, I just find it amazing that, especially dolmens, that you find dolmens everywhere across the whole world. And uh, they clearly were able to go and transmit that knowledge over last distances. Uh, I was going to run through a few different, this is pretty basic stuff here. Uh, I want to run through some uh, different types of monuments. Standing stones, pretty obvious. Uh, shadow lines, phallic symbols, uh, they're pretty much everywhere as well. Uh, common stone rows. I know Peter's doing a tour with Maryvale tomorrow. Uh, fascinating place. Uh, Northwest, uh, Northeast Ireland uh, has vast quantities of stone rows and double stone rows. Seem to be a very popular. The majority of them are also on a north south line as well. Uh, a lot of stone rows, uh, some in Sardinia as well. They, have 18 uh, uh, standing stones in a, in a stone row, and they're doing different things. They're doing the metonic cycle. 
Uh, so Stone Row is doing many different things. There's a different theme at them all, but the ones in the northeast and the northwest of Ireland are incredibly interesting. I'm researching them at the moment. Um, stone circles, everyone's familiar with stone circles. Uh, there's a reason, I'm gonna get you some monuments you're probably not aware of here, but uh, usually lunar numbers associate with these, the nine maidens, uh, 13 stones for the 13 lunar months in a year, or 19 stones, uh, like a lunar calendar. Um, this one is Boscowan and uh, Boscowan, uh, standing stone in the middle as well. Uh, quite a little interesting site that. Um, Pool and the Bruin Dolmen in the west, uh, uh, west of Ireland in County Clare, and this is one in Italy. Um, they almost look identical to each other. Same type of stone, and the way it fractures and erodes over time still looks the same. Um, so, and these are the questions. I, I want to know why we have certain types of monuments. This is what I'm rising to. I want to know why we have certain types of monuments that are iconic across the whole of Europe, and then we have monuments that are pretty unique to specific areas. Here's the passage to them here. You'll see Newgrange is like a kidney-shaped monument, or uh, it's got, it's not exactly circular, it's almost like a kidney shape, or a womb shape, as some people say, uh, which I'm open to that theory. Um, and this is something I'm going to focus on in a moment, passage to us. Uh, West Kennet Longborough there, uh, unique to pretty much England, southeast, southwest. Um, long trapezoid shape, but basically the same as a passage tomb, chambered mounds, astronomy goes inside, uh, and some of the recesses have acoustics as well. And then we have monuments like this. This is a court tomb. I know you was with me in Tyrone last week, and you missed this one, you. I want to get you back for this one. Uh, this is Craig and Nebeski court tomb. This is incredibly important because this was dug out of the bog in 1979. It's probably the most recent find of a megalithic uh, tomb intact. And uh, you'll notice there's no roof on it. There's like a, a line that goes through the whole monument, and that's incredibly important. It's actually very like Bellis Knapp that Maria was talking about yesterday, with the two horns on it. Um, and they actually may be uh, similar to the Sardinian mon monuments as well, but for, for the bunt of a better word, they call them court tombs because it looks like there's a courtyard in front of them. There's 360 of those in the northeast and northwest of Ireland, and nobody researches them. They're just given the name of court tomb and they're ignored. And they're probably one of the most fascinating things because they all, almost all of them face north, south, and the north-south line runs through the monument like that. And that's why there is no roof on it. We know that because this was dug out of the bog and that's how they found it. And up until that point, they actually presumed they all had roofs on them and that they'd just been robbed over time. But the north-south line that runs through that is a meridian line and they were mapping the sky like that. A meridian line going up and if you want to map the, the poles, you put up a meridian line and you see what happens as constellations pass that meridian line. That's how you do cosmology, that's how you do astronomy. Uh, very similar to the shape of a long barrow as well, with that trapezoid. <laughs> then you have these, the Hunnaben, I had a Dutch guy yesterday I was speaking to. Um, uh, Drenthe, there's 54 of these, and they all look almost identical. They're like a passage tomb, and the only difference is you enter through uh, the, the side of the passage instead of down at one end. And that's all that's left. The mound is gone, but they're just left with the passageways. Incredibly big stones as well. Um, 54 of those in the one region. They're almost identical to each other. There's no diversity in that culture. There's no art. There's no diversity in the megaliths. And this is what makes me realize that there's something really weird going on. It's not like there was a free transmission of knowledge. They weren't just traversing across Europe free will. And it's like they were refugees, that they just hit different pockets and they set up camp again. And they took what knowledge they had left uh, from either a cataclysm or something. And they didn't have one of everybody. They didn't have an artisan. Uh, they hadn't got an, an engineer in some cases, or they had a, an astronomer or an acoustician. It's like they were missing, they all, everybody has 70% of the puzzle. Not everybody has 100% in all the different regions. Love this place. This is the biggest henge in Ireland. It's uh, incredibly, it's about 200 meters across. Some interesting numerology with that. I don't want to say it now because I'm releasing it in the documentary, but that is actually a dolmen in the center of it, believe it or not. And you can see it's not uh, exact center, it's off center, which is important. Uh, it's in Belfast City. It's only two miles from Belfast City. The well, henges and earthworks, yeah, they're very common across the British Isles, uh, little parts of Europe as well, but they seem to be mostly common here in the British Isles. Artwork, spirals and solar whales. This is incredibly interesting. A, sol a loony solar calendar for Northumberland. Uh, this is the Lock Crew art. I talked about Lock Crew yesterday. Uh, this is the solar wheel here where the sunbeam comes in. I'm going to show you this in a moment. Um, uh, but it's incredibly impressive uh, rock art where the sunbeam comes down like that. So 
So there's all the different types of monuments, all the different styles and creations they were up to. And there is some other ones on top of that, but for the best part, they're the ones that are commonplace. That brings us back to cosmology, art, and megaliths. So, like I say, 75% of the rock art of Europe is on that little island there. High quantity of passage tombs with rock art. It's one of the oldest regions. 45% uh, is actually at Newgrange and North, those two passage tombs themselves. Also boasts the oldest region, Carol Moore. Yeah, that's Carol Moore up there again. That's 5400 BC, by the way. Uh, it doesn't even make sense why 20 miles away there's another megalithic site called Carol Keel, uh, which is, comes at 3500 BC. For 1700 years or so, maybe 2000 to 1700 years, there was nothing. And then they pop another megalithic uh, cemetery complex 20 miles away after 1700 years. Personally, I think they, uh, there was a sunken landmass and that they came and they hit the west, life, west coast of Europe and landed at different landing bays. And that's why we see gaps in, in time. Uh, we don't see any evolution in culture here. We just see two different time frames. Uh, the north-south aligned monuments which indicate knowledge of a polar alignment in astronomy. The north of Ireland it seems to be very focused on that uh, up there. And that's where it links with the rock art that I explained to you earlier. Uh, the court tombs as well with the meridian line. Rock art and calendar building. Uh, the aim of the Passage Grave Cosmology book I did, the New Grange Series Mystery, was to kind of get all these ideas into one book, because at that time I hadn't actually been compiled as a cosmology. These guys had a cosmology, a very complex cosmology, a very intense social complexity to put all this stuff together at a time frame when you just wouldn't expect it in 4000 BC. And uh, this is the Note Calendar Stone. I'm going to break this down for you in a little moment as well, but uh, I've done it in uh, a graphic there just so you can see and highlight the features of the stone itself. So what is a passage grave? Well, that's a good question. Chambered mound, cairn, temple of worship, astronomical observatory, a grave for the dead with a passageway, or acoustic chamber. Call it anything you want, really. Does it serve any purpose calling it a passage grave? No, not really. Um, astronomical observatory is probably the best one to, to call it. Stone Age University, uh, acoustic chambers. I think they're all better names than what we give them, so I do like to point that out to people. I use the term passage grave because I have to, I'm constrained to that. For the, um, there's a cross section of new grains there. This is important as well. Uh, you can see how long the passageway is. They were able to penetrate a sunbeam 60 feet down to the back chamber. And in order to do that, they had to map that sun out in the horizon for about, say, about 50 years. Uh, they're at the mercy of the Irish weather as well. After mapping it out and doing site surveying for 50 years, then they have to build the internal structure of the chamber first. Then they have to build the passageway. And then they build it from the inside out. And then they have to build all the mound around it. And then how they even mapped all that out was they put the great circle, which is a stone circle, around the passage tomb first to get all their alignments right. It's an incredibly com complex thing to build a passage tomb. And that's just one of them. There's hundreds of them. Uh, and you can see the corbel vaulted ceiling then going right up. It's actually quite a high structure inside. It's, uh, goes up some 10 meters or so. So what is passage grave cosmology? Well, passage graves have passageways. They've got definite solar alignments, for example, Newgrange. Uh, sunbeam comes in on the 21st of December at 8.58 a.m., lasts for 17 minutes, and you have to wait a whole year for it again. It does happen a day or so either side, but accurately on the 21st of December. They also have a lunar association with the measurements, for example, nose, and I'm gonna go into some of this uh, as best I can anyway. Uh, they have definite stellar alignments as well, four knocks and Carol Keel. Um, the solar alignment is the only alignment accepted by mainstream archaeology, uh, and that's because they can't escape it. Um, actually, my an archaeologist, Michael J. O'Kelly, when he discovered the alignment of the sun at Newgrange, it really changed everything. It actually revolutionized archaeoastronomy. And uh, archaeologists, they take the attention off the astronomy by saying only a small number have solar alignments. Well, they're not calculating the stars, and they're not calculating the moon. And that is true. Only some of them do have solar alignments but they also have other alignments which you just don't take into account. We'll take a look at the solar alignments first. Why the solstices and the equinoxes? Why is that so important? And why was the obsession with the solstices and the equinoxes? It was actually not very an intriguing thing to the megalithic builders. They, they didn't care less about them. It was just a fixed day to do their astronomy. 
Uh, they didn't have dates and calendars like we do today. If we want to do astronomy, we have to go to an astronomy program. We can tell them where the moon and the sun's going to be, the planets, everything else. We can plan it all out. These guys needed to plan when to do their astronomy because we have summer constellations and we've got winter constellations. And they changed throughout the year. So fixating a definite day to do astronomy, like solstice or an equinox, is a very clever thing to do. And once you realize that, they actually did it to a certain uh, moment of a day as well. There's a thing called the heliacal rising of a star. Uh, and that goes back to that Pleiades stone I showed you. They basically waited for their star uh, to be drowned out by the sunrise. That's what the heliacal, helios meaning the sun, heliacal rising of a star. So they were able to pinpoint their astronomical observations to a solstice and a moment of the day on that solstice. In other words, it was Swiss watch precision. Uh, so what did the solstice alignments tell us? Well, they physically interpret, uh, what physical interpretation do they have? Well, if you're able to do your astronomy and you're able to fixate your astronomy to one definite day of the year and you figure something out on that day, well, you can come back the next year and see if it's still going to happen. Because don't forget, if you don't have that, anybody of knowledge, you've got to do it all from scratch. And you're doing it all from scratch with stone, earth, and mud. Uh, and it's quite ingenious what they did. So you come back and you figure out it's the same cycle, okay. And you keep doing that over. And don't forget, these guys were building monuments that were generations old. I mean, their, their grandsons were probably finishing off the monuments. You know, you've you got to understand that was an incredibly, you know, ambitious task to do that. Um, but they noticed longer cycles, and they noticed moon cycles takes about, the metonic is 18.6 years, so you've got to keep monitoring stuff every day. So they mixed the sun and the moon with lunisolar calendars, and they mixed stargazing with lunar calendars so to watch for longer epochs, and it cycles within cycles within cycles. And that's the key thing, and it all starts with solstices and equinoxes. Uh, it's like the, the starting point for their body of knowledge. This is uh, Loch Crew, County Meath. Uh, there's actually two main, there's four hills there, uh, but there's two main ones. This is one, this is the other, and you can see all the different passage tombs uh, and the complexity of them there. Uh, but the whole of Loch Crew, all of those four hills, it was a massive solar mapping complex. Uh, incredible achievements of complex calendar building is uh, prevalent on the site. Three phases of construction over 800 years. That's how long that building program was at Loch Carroll Keel. Considering the life expectancy was anywhere between 30 and 50, it's a lot of generations building at that monument. Um, and a lot of hand-me-down knowledge as well, so it's, a, it's incredibly important, uh, the phase construction as well. And it's provided a solid foundation for more complex astronomy in other parts of Ireland. Uh, personally, that's why I think you've got Carol Moore, 5400 BC in Sligo, 20 miles away you have Carol Keel, then you have Loch Crew, and then you have Newgrange at about 3000 BC. And that's why you see the evolution over those 2,000 years. I mean, it took them a long time just to map out the this, this solar year, which is, I'm going to explain in a moment, which is those 150 passage tombs over Loch Crew. That's what they look like. There's Cairn T, Loch Crew Cairn T on the left. That's Loch Crew Cairn L on the right. This one is opened up to the spring and autumn equinox. Uh, you can still go there today and get access and watch the sun rise alignment on the rock art. Uh, this one's closed off at the moment, Karen L. There's actually really sophisticated art in there showing you solar eclipse that happened in about uh, the fourth millennium BC as well. And this is what gives you the compass alignment. Summer solstice, sunrise is 45 degrees, it's northeast. Summer solstice, sunset is northwest. Winter solstice, sunrise is southeast. Winter solstice, sunrise is southwest. And that's in the British Isles, that is. Um, it's not exactly, it's about 136 degrees in uh, azimuth instead of 135. It's pretty damn close. And uh, you have a natural compass made from all the megalithic passage tombs of Ireland and Britain, for that matter. And uh, predominantly in Ireland, we have evidence with all these solar wheels. They have a lots of circular wheels in their artwork with eight segments in it like that. North, south, east, and west. North, east, north, west, south, east, south, west. And uh, this is the importance of the art, because the art is explaining to you what they were doing. You can have all the alignments of the day, but if you have art to back it up, it's a double checkpoint. Uh, here's a simulation of the sunbeam coming into Loch Crew. Uh, comes down the chamber. That's what it looks like inside on the left. And that's what it does. It hits this solar wheel up here, this egg segmented solar wheel. And you can see the direction of the sunbeam. Comes up high, and it goes in that direction there. That's what the solar wheels there. There's three solar wheels that the sunbeam hits, by the way. They were basically telling you, this is our solar wheel, and this is our eight days. 
Let me see the direction of the arrow again. This is the equinox stone, what they call the equinox stone at La Cruz. It's on the back, very back recess of the chamber. Wow, this is incredibly, it's just only a tiny little fragment. This is in the uh, museum in Valletta. Uh, it comes from Hagarim, a little pottery shard. And you can see it's got the eight segmented solar wheel. This is another tie in with Malta, by the way. Uh, Malta's got a lot of art, but it seems to be the solar wheels are uh, unique to the British Isles, and particularly Ireland. Um, take notice that you can see there's all rays on the outside of the circle. There's more rays on this side than there is on this side. And personally, I think this is showing you summer, summer and winter. More rays for summer, less rays for winter. But you can see that they have the eight segmented wheel there as well. Same recesses, same temples over Malta and there is Pasha's tombs. Pasha's tombs and the temples of Malta are not really much different. They're different in name, but uh, not so much different in engineering design and astronomy. This is where it gets a little bit funny because this is not a compass layout. Take note of that. They've turned this into the Wheel of the Year. We just recently had Beltany Festival here. It should actually be the 4th of May, by the way. Uh, it's a Christian day, the 1st of May. They've Christianized the whole uh, ancient megalithic calendar into a pagan calendar. Uh, Lunasa, these are names in Irish, by the way. Beltane is the English pronunciation for an Irish word, Beltany, which means month of May in Irish. Same as Sawan celebration, that means month of November in Irish, Gaelic. And uh, these are the halfway points in between summer solstice and equinox. Halfway point is Sawan. The halfway point is Imbolg or Imbolc. That's the 3rd of February, and the halfway point is Bel Beltany. That's why they call it the first day of summer. Well, the first day of summer is actually the 4th of May, but uh, not to be nitpicking too much. But So these guys took all these eight days, the, the north, south, east, west lines, uh, sorry, the northwest, north, east, and the south, east, southwest for the equinoxes and the solstices. They took those four days and they split them in two again, basically. And uh, they then started developing time, they st or a notion of time. And they basically had a 16-month, they had a 16-month uh, solar year. We have a 12-month because it suits us, and uh, we base our 12 months on, we squeeze in 13 lunar months into a solar year, and that's why we have the remainder uh, of the leap year as well. We calculate that in as well. But there's 13 lunar months in a solar year. But these guys worked on a 16-month calendar, and they basically broke down the equinoxes and solstices. Solstices, they broke them into the halfway points, which is the four, cross, what they call the cross-quarter days, Beltany, Lunasa, Sawan, and Imbolc, and then they further broke these halfway points again. And how we know we did that, I'll have to rush them a little bit, uh, is they, this is, this is in Loch Crew, Patrickstown Hill rock art, this is in Note. This is a primitive version of this, this one you've seen already. And each one of those rays is one of the 16 days of the year. They represent the months, and then they have those little slashes or dots uh, for the remainders of the day. So they had like a 22, 23, and 24 day month, and those 16 months made up their solar year. So it was the first calendar basically in Ireland. And this is the sun, they have rays coming out of it. It's the sun and the moon as well. And this is the, the rays of the sun giving you these 16 days. There is other stuff on the stone here. And uh, this is the work of N.L. Thomas, by the way, uh, a New Zealand guy. Uh, who came to Ireland to research. I think he's, uh, he's not with us anymore. I think he's uh, long gone now, but uh, he did pioneer a lot of research on this. And this is what you need. You need somebody to come to one site and dedicate a lot of time to figure out just one aspect of one site. I like to put the stuff all together. That's my, that's my thing. Um, and that's what Nose looks like, the great mound of Nose with all its satellites around it. That's the passageways of Nose. It's some of the longest passageways in Europe. Uh, it's got an azimuth of 85. Azimuth 90 would be due east. So you can see it's not exactly due east. And azimuth 270 would be due west. And you can see it's not exactly due west. There's a very good reason for that. It's got a kink in the chamber as well. It's known as an couvert in French. And a quite common type of Pasha's tombs. There's a reason for that as well. They did nothing to chance. Even the number of curb stones adds up to it. If you count both ends of the curb stone, it's 254. We said there's 127 curb stones or 254 ends of the curb stones. That's a metonic. That's the number of uh, months in a metonic cycle. It's t exactly three synodic months from this angle to a passage tomb just there, and it's exactly one sidereal lunar month from this sidereal month lunar stone to the angle of the passageway. Uh, it's all in the book, by the way, and it took me a long time to explain all this. 
uh, but all the angles and all the alignments and all the artwork all ties in with each other. These guys were, they didn't want to choose between a sidereal and a synodic lunar month. Basically, in layman's language, uh, we use the 29 and a half day lunar month, that's the synodic lunar month, it's the apparent month. Uh, it's really only 27.3 days. That's the, that's the astronomical sidereal lunar month. But because the Earth spins and we're observing on the Earth, we have to add up the little bit of rotation. That's why we get an extra couple of days onto the, onto the real one. We've seen this already. You can see the constellation lines in case you didn't make it out in the video. Uh, if you notice, Ursa Major looks like a saucepan. Uh, they call it Big Bear, Little Bear, uh, Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, um, Big Saucepan, Little Saucepan. It's got a little handle on the, on the saucepan and it kind of kicks down like that. Whereas the little saucepan has a curve going up like that. And that's how you recognize the difference between the two of them. That's it with no constellation thing. It's very hard to make out unless you know what you're looking at. Uh, sometimes it's better on a dark day and when the stone's wet as well. I, mean, I took lots of ast astronomy uh, screenshots as well to explain all this. Here's the dates and times on the equinoxes. There's the Ursa Minor, there's Ursa Major. And it's aligned to its own direction in the sky in 3200 BC. Um, quite accurately as well. Those on the Pleiades constellation, this is really, really sophisticated as well. Um, this actually faces its own image in the sky, the Pleiades constellation. And if you count up all the, all the number of rays on each one of those circles, they add up to a metonic cycle as well. Uh, so, you can see there's like calibration settings as well and all sorts of calculations going on it. So they would take some art, they would focus it on its own image in the sky, and then they would try and tie it in with some sort of a lunar count. So they didn't want to count in solar years because the long counts were, you know, if you were calculating precession, it's 72 degrees for one year, or uh, 72 years for one degree. Um, so it's better to count in multiples of metonic cycles as opposed to multiples of solar years. Uh, you just get more accuracy of measurements like that. It was actually quite ingenious what they were doing. So they tied a lot of lunar calculations in with their astronomy as well. Carol Keel, Pasha's Tomb Complex. This is a really fascinating place. Most people don't even know about this, even in, within Ireland. Um, if you go to the city of Sligo, it's 20 miles away. People in Sligo don't even know about this place where it's at. It's forgotten about. It's left up on the hills. Uh, that's what they all look like. There's just passage tombs like that everywhere on top of the hills, and it's like a giant right hand, palm down, and they've put the passage tombs right on the tips of the fingertips of those mountain range. And you can see there's one just there. Very hard to make out. That's Loch Arrow, by the way. It's massive. There's beautiful scenery up there. You can see for about 40 miles in any direction. And it actually points to another passage tomb 20 miles away. It's like Queen Maeve's tomb. What's so important about Carl Keel is, um, when I went there, and I, there was no art there for me. So I took the measurements and the alignments with the compass, and I realized something very quickly. Most of the passage tombs up there almost point due north, but uh, never quite due north. They're like six degrees off north, or they're as much as just a few degrees off true north, and uh, never quite hitting it. Um, and I know that everything they do is not the chance. Everything's done accurately and specifically for a reason. Uh, the sun and the moon's ruled out because the sun doesn't get any more than northeast or northwest, and neither does the moon. So, the, uh, having passage tombs pointing almost north only needs one thing that's stellar phenomena, that's the stars. And there only is two constellations that are in that region of the sky at that time that's the Cygnus constellation and Cassiopeia. And Cygnus doesn't fit, although one of the stars of Denim might fit in through Carol Keel Karen J, but for the best part, each one of those cairns is aligned to one of the stars of Cassiopeia. And I've drawn that little, this is the Stellarium screenshot in the time frame. Uh, and this is each one of the cairns, cairn F, E, B, K, and C. They give them alphabetical names, by the way. Some of them have names like Newgrange, Noth, and Doth, personal names. Some of them just have alphabet names. And there's a little table of data. You can see the actual setting azimuth of each of the stars of Cassiopeia. Gamma cast, calf, rukba, epsilon cast, and shilir. Here's the azimuth settings. You can see that the alignments of the cairns that I've measured with the compass, as accurate as the camera, the digital compass and a magnetic compass, uh, almost only one degree out. That's incredible accuracy to do with the naked eye in that time frame. This one's two degrees out. This one's bang on. 
This one's two degrees out. This one's only one degree out. You couldn't ask for more better accuracy than that. And you've got a checkpoint of a whole group of cairns sitting up on top of a mountain range, all taking out one of the stars of Cassiopeia as Cassiopeia sets on the horizon like that. And they're all setting at different times because the constellation is quite big and the constellation comes down at an angle and it will go down one star at a time. So we're talking about the setting azimuth of each star, although it's the group of cairns in general are tracking the whole constellation at one time. And the big question is, why would they do that? Why on earth would they do that? And knowing what I know about the art and the, and the evolution of what they were doing is they probably realized, and if you think about stone rows, and this is pertinent as well, if you think about a standing stone or a stone row and you align it to a star on the horizon, after 72 years, it's off one degree because of precession. After another 72 years, it's off another degree. After another 72 years, it's off by three degrees. Three degrees is the width of the moon on the horizon. That's a really big chunk of uh, noticeability. And if, if you think about the long period of precession of 25,920 years, you don't need to go that whole processional cycle to see this thing repeat. You only need to, a 200 year window and you will notice there's something really wrong on the horizon. Actually, in Temple of Dendera in Egypt, they used to rip down the temple after 200 years, turn it, twist it, and build it up again, and realign the, the central chambers to the star Sirius on the horizon. And um, we know that because of all the multiple foundations found at Temple of Dendera. So it leads you to think that they were tracking the whole sky. And the only one reason we do that is, I think, personally, does because of precession. And if you wanted to know what precession was, well, how do you know that the stars aren't all whizzing around? You need to watch them, you need to map them, and that's their observ observational cosmology. So they did that. They took another piece out of the puzzle. They went, okay, well, let's fix that. Let's, let's see, is the whole sky processing at the same rate? Uh, how would you do that? You would take a constellation and prove that the constellation is processing, not just one star. Because one star is no good to you. You need them tracking in a group. So they tracked a group of stars, and they took, targeted Cassiopeia, and they built a whole Pachetium complex to this whole I mean, it's a massive undertaking just to figure out one thing, but they did that, and they did it time and time again at every passage grave complex in Ireland. They were eliminating a piece of the puzzle, one piece at a time, over very long epochs. And there you can see the processional wobble um, with the North Star. Great to see the little diagrams just to understand it. So like I say, it's 13,000 years for the wobble, one way, 13,000 years. We all are familiar with procession, yeah? Okay. Um, Then that leads you to Newgrange and Sirius. So, personally, I think Carol Keel, 3500 BC, uh, it's carbon dated in that time as well, and archaeoastronomy dated by myself for the Carol Keel Cassiopeia connection to 3500 BC as well. Newgrange is about 3200 BC. Uh, there's no art at Carol Keel, and but they have got a light box at Carol Keel, very similar to Newgrange. Uh, and I personally think Carol Keel was the forerunner to Newgrange. And when they figured out that the sky was processing, they moved their camp and they went down to Newgrange to the Boyne Valley. Um, so, and they set up camp again to try and figure out procession. And that's why I called the book The Newgrange Serious Mystery, because I went on this journey and crusade of knowledge, trying to figure out all this material. And uh, it led me to back to Newgrange again. Um, uh, on the same azimuth, on the same day of the solar alignment, you have something very strange happening in the stars at nighttime. You have the star Sirius rising, only in this time frame, by the way, you have the star Sirius rising on the horizon, and it's almost in the exact same position as the sun in this epoch on the 21st of December. So 12 hours later in the day, after their little solar alignment that we know we can prove, you have the star Sirius rising on the horizon, and it goes up like that, okay? They were in the business of noticing stars. They drew constellations. That's why I put that in there for the presentation. They were very aware of constellations. They were very aware of how it moves around the North Pole. That's the Ardmore Equinox down. They were well aware of this stuff. You can bet your bottom dollar that they knew about the star Sirius on the horizon, being in almost exactly the same position of the sun. Then you give procession long enough, one degree every 72 years, that star Sirius, that star Sirius will come up on the horizon, and it will just keep coming over, and just keep coming over and it will process along like that. Eventually, it would have migrated exactly inside the chamber, just like the sunbeam did. Give procession long enough again, it will go out of alignment. Sometime inside that 200-year window that Newgrange was built, you can pretty much safely say, and I'll show you this again in a moment, you can pretty much say that Sirius was inside that chamber doing exactly the same thing as the sun. And Sirius is a very bright star, by the way. It's the fifth brightest star. It's very close to us. 
Uh, sorry, it's one of the brightest stars, it's the fifth closest to us, the fifth closest star to us where we're situated in the galaxy. Uh, so I call it the New Grange Sirius booster because Sirius was aligned to that. And I said to you at the start, there's my little calculation for you. You don't have to worry about the trigonometry too much. It's, it's just school by trigonometry. It's not in, well, you can measure from the center of the chamber to the center of the entrance stone where the equinox is, to the center of the tri-spiral. You can calculate that very long, skinny triangle. You can triangulate with the tan calculation there. It's exactly one degree of precession from the center of that tri-spiral <coughs> to the center of that equinox line. And I personally think that that was the tri-spiral to represent the star series on the horizon, uh, which is a triple star system, by the way. And uh, I reckon they uh, marked the event inside with that tri-spiral I showed you in the back recess of the chamber. And I say it's the only theory that, ex well, it's scientific, it's astronomical, and it's the only one that explains why that tri-spiral is inside as well. And I think they marked the event. I think they, they actually specifically built new grains to monitor. To, it's like a crude processional calculator. It's, it's not like Swiss watch, but it's, it, they, they probably said, okay, this distance here is one degree. That's another one degree. They were able to then map out that it was a physical distance on that new grains thing. They could probably tell you where the next constellation was going to be in about 200 years. Very roughly, but. Which brings us back to the questions, who were they? Where did they come from? Uh, where did they get this knowledge? I want to run through a few things here. This is a really interesting artifact. This was found at Noth, it's called a mace head, it's, but it's so ornate. It's made out of actually Orkney flint. The only source for this, the nearest source for this flint is in the Orkneys, which is where all the spirals, and I'll show you this in a moment, which is where all uh, the Pasha's tombs are as well, Maze Hound, like I spoke about yesterday. There was direct collaboration and trading between the Orkneys, again by boat mariners, uh, between the Orkneys and Newgrange. And there we are, and the archaeologists ignore this. There's a little artist, guys. Incredibly ornate piece of uh, Orkney flint found at, no at Note. I'm just going to link up a few different places in Europe for so you that it's actually not just about Ireland, it's about many places. And because we have 75% of the rocker, that's why I've focused it in Ireland. But this is the Looney Solar Calendar, just very near where I live, in, uh, near Donegal. Uh, this is on an Equinox line, and this is on the Solstice line. And there's 13 rings there calculating a lunar. This is very, very identical to almost stuff in England, Northumberland, uh, almost identical rock art. This is uh, bolting glass in County Wicklow. Uh, it's a tri-cornered, uh, concave, almost parabolic uh, ceremonial basin inside the passage tomb. And this is one in Tarjan and Temple in Malta, which you can't see anymore. They've actually removed this from Tarjan and Temple in Malta. Uh, I took this photograph about six years ago. And they put a new uh, dome over the temple. But this was a ceremonial basin uh, that they used to put the offerings of cremations for the dead in. Uh, another thing linking up Malta and Ireland. Veined leaf rock art, again, one over there, one there, one there, one there. Piers Platt in Brittany, another passage down there. West Trace Stone with all the spirals again, conjoined spirals as well. Back to Newgrange, you can see the spirals as well. The, same, uh, same design, same plan, same company doing all this. Conjoined spiral again in Bugiba, Malta. Uh, conjoined spirals in Isla Vida, Orkneys as well. This was one culture traversing Europe. Uh, a unified Neolithic, megalithic culture. Pick whichever name. Neolithic era, megalithic construction. Just namesakes. They were versed in art, versed in geometry, versed in astronomy. First in acoustics, first in architecture, first in surveying, first in sea navigation, first in shamanism, and that's just to name a few. That's how we have to explain megaliths. That's the way I try to explain megaliths. That's what they had. That was their body of knowledge. You can measure and quantify it all. And these are the major hotspots. The Orkneys, Newgrange, Gavernee, and Malta. And again, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense unless you bring in a maritime culture, which is largely ignored by archaeology. As a matter of fact, they say they were living by the coast because they had a rich source of food to feed themselves to build the megaliths, which is nonsense. Uh, they were able to traverse all those terrains there quite easily and transmit their knowledge. Oh, my lovely little golden boat. I love this object. This is uh, actually my mum just uh, lives at the top of Ireland. Uh, this was found in the fields just in front of her house on the edge of Loch Foyle. Uh, known as the Brighter Horde, uh, was an offering to the sea god uh, Mananan MacLear. Uh, dates to about 1500 BC, uh, and the mythology 
that was written down, you're going to see the mythology in a moment, uh, uh, from these ancient, uh, ancient tales that were wrote down by the monks in about 8th, 7th, 8th century to the 12th century. And there's hundreds of books surviving in Ireland. We're the only country in Europe with a written record of the megalithic builders. Inside the Irish mythology writings, they talk about the people of the mounds. Uh, the people of the mounds died out about 1000 BC. 5000 to 1000 BC was their, their reign, reign of construction. The Celts, their very earliest, were in Ireland at about 1500 to about 1000 BC. So there was an overlap there and they inherited. The Milesian Gaels basically conquered the people of the mounds and uh, they called them the She. Uh, she is the mound in Irish. And uh, there's an overlap there for a few hundred years and it's the only tale. It's a fragmented tale and it was written down and kind of corrupted by the monks somewhat. Uh, these are actually some of the books. This is a 12th century manuscript here. Some of these books are actually nearly preserved totally uh, uh, and they're works of art. Uh, they're locked up 24-7 uh, in, in the museums, but uh, no access to them. But uh, This is the Book of Ballymount, the Book of Leinster. Um, another famous one, the Book of Invasions. Many uh, other times. The Book of Invasions uh, talks about the five groups of people who conquered Ireland. They talk about floods. The flood was proved uh, 6,000 BC, there was a flood came in at the west of Ireland, wiped out a whole Neolithic settlement, uh, and it's proved the Irish mythology tales uh, some truth to it because there's a black silt layer there that you can measure. Uh, the legendary High Brazil, this, they call this the Other Atlantis. This was on maps uh, till about the 18th century until they just wiped it off the maps because they couldn't find it. It's most likely underneath the waves. Uh, ancient mythology talks about this, the mythical island that appears in the mists. And the geological data, as you'll see in a moment, uh, it's where the actual country of Brazil gets its name from. It gets its name from this high Brazil. They went looking for high Brazil and they found the real, the other Brazil. Uh, so they call it Brazil. Um, and there's the rock wall sea trench. There's a sandbank there and there's a little peak there. About the, it's, high Brazil is allegedly about the size of uh, Greater London, the 20 miles in diameter, uh, 40 miles in diameter. And uh, it's about 100 miles off the coast, west coast of Ireland, about there. You can see it on the map again, there's, another, there's loads of these maps, by the way, uh, showing you high Brazil. Uh, I've actually seen them, as, uh, there's a globe in the Globe Museum in Vienna. Uh, it's got like the Mercantor globe, you can see it on that as well. Uh, it's another interesting angle as well. I was aware of the Dogon culture, and that's why I put the tagline on the book, uh, linking passage grave cosmology with Dogon symbology, because the Dogon and their symbolism is exactly the same as the megalithic art and architecture and their cosmology as well. They were into heliacal rising, they used the same thing, the solar wheel, this four-pronged circle, concentric uh, rings, spirals. And this is a woman called Teresa Vergani. She wrote a uh, paper on this. Uh, she's a Portuguese researcher. Basically shows that the Dogon, their artwork shows that they had the solar wheel and the same as La Crew. The spiral, like that of Newgrange, is worse than Dogon culture. Uh, concentric circles common all across megalithic major symbolism to the Dogon. Dogon also have a complex culture of ritual regarding Sirius pertaining to co the cosmology. Newgrange is also a major alignment to Sirius involving the spiral like I showed you. And it's most likely was used to calculate precession of the equinox. And they talk about precession as well, but not, they talk in their oral history that there's this time slip of stars in the sky. Uh, and the Dogon may be preserving an ancient knowledge. And I just want to mention this researcher next. That's Laird Scranton. Uh, he's going to be with me in August. Uh, he's a Dogon researcher. He's got a book coming out on Scarra Bray. We're going to make a pilgrimage up to the Orkneys uh, for research. He's coming with me as well, I believe. And uh, we're going to uh, get some of this stuff on record as well. But he's provided a very interesting angle on Scarra Bray, that the Dogon may be a remnant of the original peoples of uh, Scarra Bray. Uh, incredibly interesting site in uh, the Orkneys. And I have a little symposium. Uh, Hugh is actually there. I just stuck him in there over me today. So he's making a little appearance as well, myself and Maria. I just added him onto the list, but you can check us all out. I've got Laird coming over from New York. Uh, we'll be coming just directly from New York. So uh, it's going to be a symposium for the documentary. And this is the documentary, Megalithic Odyssey. Uh, I know I put a lot of knowledge in there today. There's a lot more in it uh, than that. But uh, I just tried to give you the, the interesting snippets. Um, and the aim of the documentary, I guess, is to put the acoustics, the astronomy, the Earth energies, that's why I have Maria, she's co-presenting uh, the documentary with me, um, the artifacts, the culture, the engineering uh, on all the monuments, and, and tackle each one of these bodies of knowledge, and, and sometimes media is the best way to do that, so that's the aim of the documentary. Eight parts, uh, again, you can go to Megalithic Odyssey for that. 
uh, odyssey.com. Uh, you can check out the website. You can subscribe for your free online pilot episode. You can catch me at jamesmarker.com. And there is my podcast for other megalithic artists who I love to interview. Well, thank you for your time. <laughs>